so let me go to my slides i got some google models i want to show you as well so can somebody give me a thumbs up that you guys can see my screen okay great so we're going to be talking about valuation but i'm going to be attacking it from four different angles right we normally only really look at valuation in, in terms of math, in terms of numbers. But I'm going to give you three other lenses of which to look at the evaluation. And then we're going to bring it all together at the end in a summary. And then Uncle Carl has built you a little cool nifty model where you can implement all the stuff that, that I'm going to teach you. So nobody else in the world looks at valuation the way I do. Nobody, right? Nobody else in the world is doing this. So you guys are going to be the first people in the world to kind of see this, right? I've built this training over the past three or four days. No, not even John's seen this. I literally no. finished the training 20 minutes ago, right? I've been at this like hardcore trying to get this right for you guys. So before we start though, there's gonna be a lot of numbers in here. So if you were in Tampa, you remember I said, I want you to all shout really loud, you know, I love numbers and numbers love me right so remember you might need to go through this recording a few times and i'll send you the slides and you can play with the model right and we're going to stack this from a foundation level all the way up to like real freaking ninja financial analysis that we're going to be doing on some deals so when i look at valuation i look at valuation as as a four-legged stool really we, we look at financial valuation we look at valuation that's impacted by seller psychology. Obviously, if somebody's really motivated to sell a business, they'll sell for a lower amount than for somebody that's, you know, not really that motivated. We talk a lot on red light, green light calls about something called the MUD score. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to build on that as well. The structure of the deal can also impact valuation. If you're paying all the money at closing, you could pay a lot less for a business than if you're doing an annuity deal and you're paying for that business over a 10 year period, you've got to offer more. But how does that work? And then a business also has something called a transfer value, right? So as we go through this training, I'm going to show you what transfer value means and, and effectively how to calculate it and how to adjust a valuation based on how transferable it is in terms of value to somebody else, i.e. you as the new owner so we're going to start off with the financial stuff first and then we'll look at all the other three elements so what what i'm going to show you real quick is that there are actually five ways that, that you can value a, a business the most popular method that, that we teach you is we value a business based on something called a profit multiple right so if you've never looked at any of the valuation training before if you're brand new into protege you joined through the tampa event uh, a lot of this stuff's going to be really useful but if you've looked at valuation stuff before what i'm going to show you in the next five minutes is going to be a really nice kind of refresher so profit multiples is the most popular there's also a method called the balance sheet method uh, where we look at the net asset value of the balance sheet and then we look at adding goodwill. We'll get into that. Um, and then for the first time ever, I'm going to show you what a discounted cash flow valuation looks like. You never, ever, ever need to use this in a deal, but I'm going to show you how to do it so that you're adding that extra little skill. If, if someone ever talks to you about discounted cash flow, you'll know exactly what it is and how to do it. There's another method called the capitalized earnings method. It's kind of similar. The discounted cash flow but with a few differences i'll show you that and then all businesses have something called a liquidation value and that becomes very very important when we look at the transfer value of a business so i'm going to do that as well so when we talk about profit multiples oftentimes we ask ourselves well we've got this business what's the multiple right why is a technology business sell for a higher multiple than say a a commercial cleaning business or an engineering business and all deal multiples are tracked by the deal stats value interests, which is owned by Bureau Van Dyke, one of the big data analysis firms out there. We've got a subscription to this. John did a deep dive training on this. Um, gosh, John, was it late last year? Uh, where you yeah, went I think so, yeah. Um, these numbers come out and we share them with you. We have a subscription. We, we can download them and we can put them into... Uh, the groups for you. So the Q1 2023 numbers are not out yet because we're, we're only two months the way through Q1, but we do have the Q4 2022 uh, multiples. And what they do is they track lots of different data points to these guys. It's a very interesting um, database. So you can see over time 
how these multiples kind of spike up and spike down on average. Um, and, you know, we kind of had a, um, a, a kind of a low point at the start of 2022, and then multiples have started uh, to come back again. But the most important set of multiples that we look at is we, we look at the price that the selling price, the asking price divided by EBITDA, which is our main profit measure. We look at these multiples by size, because as you know, the bigger the profit, the bigger the multiple. That's why a company like Apple is worth 24 times its EBITDA, whereas most small businesses tend to be valued around the 3x range. So what this does for micro businesses, zero to a million dollars in revenue, the multiples are lower, one to five million, we're kind of banding in between that three to five range as an average. And then as we get to five to $10 million businesses, the multiples can go higher. And then obviously $10 million deals and above, probably up to $25 million businesses, we've got these kind of higher multiples as well. So we're really focusing on that kind of brown line, which tends to band in between that three and five, and it's kind of trending back down to about three times right now. And what these guys also do, which is really cool, is using NACE codes, which is the way America kind of classifies its types of businesses. And these are very, very similar, no matter what country. Australia's a bit higher, UK, Canada, US, they're all round the same. But what they do is they look at all the multiples per industry. And there's a really wide range. So that kind of three, three and a bit kind of average right now, the lowest values are going for around 1.8. So if you were buying educational services, you're paying on average about 1.8 times. If you're buying kind of accommodation food services, you're paying around 2.1 times. Um, if you're buying businesses in transportation and warehousing, paying around 2.9. Stay away from technology. <laughs> technology businesses are, are going for around 9, 9.7 times EBITDA. I think factored into this, John, is, is probably the larger deals. Um, you know, I'm buying lots of IT businesses and online businesses right now, you know, I'm not really paying more than five. So I think that number's skewed with a yeah, lot of- Yeah, it includes all sizes. So you already made that point though. So it's- Yeah, so, but it's a really wide range. But what you can do and you can look at this is, you know, say, well, hey, you know, I'm buying a manufacturing business. On average, those deals are around the 3.6 multiple. But what you're gonna learn as part of this training is that the multiple and the financial valuation is only one of the four parts of the equation uh, that you really want to look at. So, so let's do the math based on um, using EBITDA multiples. So again, start from the very, very basics. Let's say we've got a business that's doing $2 million in revenues. It's got a million dollars cost of sales. So that's the cost for the business to produce the service or the product uh, that it sells to customers. So that would leave you with a million dollars of gross margin, uh, gross profit, and that would give you a 50% gross margin for that business. And then the business has overheads, which we sometimes refer to as S, G, and A. And when you look at most financial accounts or tax returns from a business, uh, they'll quote what they call EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. So to calculate EBITDA, we kind of have to add back the depreciation and the amortization of intangible assets. Let's say in this example, that was $50,000. So we had a million dollars of gross profit, less than $750,000 of overhead, $250,000 was the EBIT number. We're adding back the depreciation and the amortization. So our EBITDA is $300,000, and that would be a 15% profit margin. And the reason we use EBITDA is that's the most common uniform way of measuring profit. Because when we're looking at businesses, you might look at two completely identical businesses that have got the same EBITDA, but they might have very different capital structures. So the interest might be really high in one business, but really low in another. They might have completely different schedules for depreciation and amortization. So we want to net all that out and just say, well, hey, what's the operating profit? What's the profitability of this business before all of these things kind of get added and taken away and adjusted. So EBITDA is always the common measure that we're looking to use. Now, there's loads of different adjustments to kind of EBITDA. One of them is EBITDA versus something called SDE, which stands for Seller's Discretionary Earnings. We're gonna go into that. 
Uh, we're going to talk about something called addbacks, which is a recasting of the EBITDA number to reflect the change of ownership. So whatever the owner's doing in the business with comp, expenses, families on payroll. Um, I once looked at a business and uh, the, the guy had put all of his uh, pet dogs, um, the cost of the dogs and their insurance and food and all that stuff through the book. And I said, well, hey, are you, you leaving the dog as part of the business? He's like, no. So, you know, you're recasting for all that. Then we'll look at um, the diff what's the difference between enterprise value of a business and equity value of the business. We'll look at that. And then we'll look at whatever adjustments we need to make to the valuation in terms of the working capital. So to go from EBITDA to SDE, all we're doing is we're adding back the total amount of the owner's compensation, their salary, their benefits, and their expenses. So if you've got a business doing $300,000 and the owner is earning $200,000 from the business in all of the different ways, then the true SDE in that business would be half a million dollars. So if you go to biz buy sell and you look at a deal and the broker's telling you, hey, this business is doing $500,000 of SDE, you then need to do the math the other way. You need to say, well, okay, what's the owner taking out? Um, what's the benefit? What are the expenses uh, that the owner's uh, taking out of the business? And then you would work that back down to the EBITDA number. And then once you've got EBITDA, we then need to do the recasting exercise. We need to look at, well, what are the addbacks and what are the takebacks? They're very, very different. An addback is something that you add to the EBITDA to create that recasted profit. And a takeback is where you're taking away from that EBITDA number to calculate the recasted profit. So let's say our EBITDA was $300,000. Let's say the total owner's compensation plus benefits plus expenses was $200,000. And then let's say we've got another $200,000 of addbacks. There might be uh, lots of family members on the payroll that actually don't do any work and they don't need replacing. So those would all be legitimate addbacks. And then the takebacks would be, well, okay, we've got to replace the owner with a general manager. And let's say that's $100,000, $150,000. And then in some deals, you might find that you decide not to buy the real estate. So if you don't buy the real estate and you're then going to be renting the real estate from the owner once you bought the business, then that cost of that rental expense needs to be a take back. So you reduce the EBITDA by the same number. So in this example, we have $300,000 of EBITDA. We added back all the total owners, comp and benefits and expenses to give us that SDE number of $500,000. Then we added all the other addbacks that we decided um, were, were in agreement. And then we took away the $250,000 of costs that we're going to incur once we buy and own that business. So our adjusted EBITDA in this example would be $450,000. So the next thing that you've got to do is you've got to look at the averages, right? You'll see this on the red light, green light. We always look at averages for numbers. So you'd repeat that exercise for the last three years. If the profitability is going up, we take a three-year average. So in this example, let's say the adjusted EBITDA this year was 450. Last year was 325. 2020 was 290. We're going to take a three-year average of that. So we're going to come out with $355,000 as that three-year average. However, if the profitability is going down, we don't take the average, we just take the lowest number. So if profit in 2020 was 590, profit in 2021 was 525, profit in 2020 is 450, but I'll take a three-year average because, hey, the profit's going down. So we take the 450 number, but then that would be a red flag, wouldn't it? In your deal analysis, you'd want to understand from the seller, is that trend likely going to continue if you were looking at a business in say september of 2023 you'd want to know what were the first statements of profit is that number going to be maintained or is it going to continue to go down because then you'll be looking at a lower number when you come to do your valuation okay so we take an average when the numbers are going up we take the lowest the final number when the numbers are going down. And then what we can do 
once we've got the recasted EBITDA, and we know the average, is we can calculate both the enterprise value and the equity value. So the enterprise value is whatever the average adjusted or recasted EBITDA is. And then we apply the multiple. I've just used three for now because you don't know what sector this business is in. So we'll use uh, the deal stats data when we get into a worked example later. So to calculate the enterprise value, the enterprise value is the value of the business. It's not the value of the equity. So that's simply your adjusted average profit multiplied by the market multiple. So in this example, we've used three. So the enterprise value of the business is a million and sixty-five thousand dollars, right? So that's the value of the business. To now calculate the value of the equity, we need to make some adjustments. And it's like you could have two houses they're both worth half a million dollars in terms of value. One's got no mortgage, so the equity value is the same as the enterprise value. But if the other house has got a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage, the equity value is only a hundred. So we're calculating now what the value of the equity or the stock or the shares in the business are. And for that, we've got to make adjustments. So the first thing we've got to do, if you've ever been through the simple model, you'll know how to do this. The first thing we need to do is we need to add any real estate. We're not buying any real estate as part of this deal, which is why we adjusted for the rent expense that we're going to have to pay in the future as the owner of the business. There's some surplus cash in the deal. How do we sell, calculate surplus cash? Well, we take... The last 12 months worth of revenue, we divide it by 12. That's the minimum amount of cash that we actually need. So in our case, that'd be $167,000. There's actually $302,000 in the bank for this business. We don't need all that. So the surplus cash is the difference, which would be $135,000. We're gonna add that to the valuation, but then we can also use that money as part of the deal structure, as part of the financing. And then if we're inheriting any debt when we buy this business, typically long-term debt or non-current liabilities, as they're called, I'll show you where they are in the accounts in a minute. If we're going to be inheriting existing debt as part of the business, we're going to deduct for that. So we're taking the million and sixty-five, we're adding the hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars, less the two hundred thousand uh, dollars of debt to inherit. So it's circa a million dollars equity value, just to keep the math nice and clean and nice and simple. And what we can also do in this as well is we can look at what the target networking capital needs to be at closing when we inherit the business. And ordinarily, I recommend having at least two months worth of revenue as your networking capital. So in, in this example, we'd need about $334,000 of networking capital in the business, including that lovely cash that's being left behind. When we look at the balance sheet, we'll be able to see whether or not that is in the ballpark. Then when we look at the balance sheet, balance sheet, the, the classic accounting equation is that the total assets minus the total liabilities equal the owner's equity. The UK, we call that shareholders funds. And it, because it's a balance sheet, we also use that as something called net asset value. And we're going to be getting into that in a little bit when we talk about the liquidation value of a business and how that is very important when we look at transfer value. We're still only looking at the financial valuation of the business at the moment. Balance sheets, you have assets. These are things that you own and you have liabilities. These are things that you owe. So assets typically have fixed assets like plant and equipment. Uh, like real estate. Uh, current assets would include cash, accounts receivables or trade debtors, as we call them in the UK, and inventory. Liabilities, current liabilities are things like payables, tax notes, uh, think money that you owe that you have to pay within the next 12 months. And then we can have non-current liabilities like long-term debt loans, long-term leases, all those different things as well. So all assets minus liabilities equals the owner's equity. So when we do a balance sheet method valuation, the balance sheet method valuation is designed for businesses that are asset rich, but their earnings poor, right? So they can have a slightly different valuation. Now, ordinarily, it's really tough to buy a business, even if you value it and you buy it using the balance sheet method. 
because it doesn't really matter what the value of the balance sheet is, the value of the assets. If you don't have any cash flow coming out of the business, you either can't A, make an annuity payment or B, you can't service the debt from an external financier that's putting the money in to allow you to buy the assets. But if we look at the balance sheet method, the balance sheet, it's all about driving down to that owner's equity or that net asset value. So let's say in this example, we've got $350,000 of fixed assets, $500,000 of current assets. So our total assets are $850,000. And then we've got $150,000 of current liabilities. So AP, tax payments, etc. And then let's say we've got $200,000 of those non-current liabilities, which you'll remember from the valuation, that's the debt that we were going to be inheriting as part of this acquisition. So our net asset value, our owner's equity is the 850, less than 350 is $500,000. And then we now, because we have the current assets, the current liabilities, we can calculate what the net working capital is, and it's one minus the other. So the net working capital in this business is $350,000. And you'll remember from the other analysis, we know we need 334. So we're kind of like bang on the money when it comes to the working capital that we're going to inherit as part of the deal. So there wouldn't be an adjustment to make for that. And then what we're looking to do with the balance sheet method is say, well, okay, what's the value of the balance sheet? In this case, it's half a million dollars. And then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate what the retained earnings are. So to calculate the retained earnings, we're looking at what the adjusted EBITDA average was, which was 335. We're going to net off the interest. We're going to net off the depreciation in the business. We're going to net off the amortization of goodwill and intangibles. We're going to calculate what the net operating income is, the pre-tax profit. So that will pretty much mirror what's going on in the tax returns, right? So let's assume $180,000 net operating income, $54,000 of tax paid, assume it's 30% in this example. So the retained earnings in this example would be $126,000. So what we're gonna do is use that retained earnings number to calculate the goodwill that we're gonna to add to the balance sheet value to give us that balance sheet method valuation. And my rule of thumb is I'm gonna to apply to those retained earnings exactly half of the multiple that I'm going to use for the EBITDA analysis. So we use 3x in the previous example. So I'm going to use half of that, which is 1.5x. So what I'm saying to the seller is, look, your balance sheet's worth half a million. That's not liquidation value. We'll talk about that later. So I'm going to apply a goodwill of one and a half times your retained after tax income and that's going to be $189,000. So add the two together, that would be a $689,000 valuation. Now, in nine times out of 10, the balance sheet method is going to give you a lower answer than the method using the profit multiple. But where you've got businesses with massive like balance sheets, but very, very low margins, so heavy industrial businesses, heavy transportation businesses, sometimes you'll find that it's, it's a more fair evaluation to do the balance sheet method than it is to do the profit multiple method. Now, all of these trainings, including the models and all the detail and a million times more analysis than what I've just showed you is in the DealMaker CEO uh, training program. So definitely go back and watch that in a lot more detail where I break it down in a lot more detail with a lot more examples. Okay, so who wants to know how to do a discounted cash flow analysis? John, we've never showed them this, have we? You're on mute, John. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, we've uh, we've talked about it before, but I don't think we've ever given them an example. So this will be yeah. I, I, last time I mentioned it on a call, somebody said, "Hey, could you spend like five minutes one day just showing us what a discounted cash flow analysis looks like, how you actually build a model?" So Uncle Carl's built you a discounted cash flow model. I don't want anybody ever to use it unless you're going to go and work on Wall Street or you're gonna get into the, the venture capital industry, you don't actually need to use a discounted cash flow model. I'm gonna show you what it is, but don't ever use it. You could just have it for uh, for reference. But discounted cash flow model is there for businesses that are kind of really high growth. And what you do is you forecast your cash flows into the future, minimum five years. You've then got to calculate something called the terminal value of all of the future cash flows beyond that five year period. 
You then need to apply a discount rate based on the risk of the deal. And then you add all that up to calculate net present value. And people are like, what the fuck is he talking about? Like, what on earth is this? So, so guys, this is what you do on Wall Street. I'm going to show you now. This is really, really interesting. But don't freak out with this stuff. I'm just showing it to you. You don't ever need to use it. But um, so this is a discounted cash flow model. Can everybody see that? Do I need to blow it up? Make up a bit bigger, yeah, Carl. Okay. That's my, so, that's my so what you're doing with discounted cash flow models, this is the deal that we looked at before, right? So you start off with uh, your current revenue and then you're forecasting growth. So let's say we're going to buy this business and we're going to grow this business at 25% per year over the next five or six years. So we're going to go from $2 million to about $7.6 million in revenues. We know what our cost of goods sold are. Let's, let's assume with our gross margin. Uh, that our gross margins are going to come down a little bit as we grow this business. We're not going to get economies of scale. Uh, so that calculates automatically what the gross profits are. It's all calculated for you. And then let's assume as we grow, our operating expenses as a percentage of revenue are going to decrease because in businesses, as you grow them, some of your costs are fixed, like your overhead. Uh, so your, your um, let's say the lease for your facility, if you can expand within your current facility, you're not paying a bigger lease just because you're growing your revenue. So there's a lot of things in a business which are fixed costs, which don't increase as the business scales. So as the business scales, we're going to get, we're going to be able to sweat that overhead a little bit better. So whilst the overhead's going to go up, it's going to go down as a percentage of the sales. So it models all that. And then we flow through from EBITDA, we, we put in depreciation, amortization, interest, we calculate pre-tax income. Let's assume we're paying, say, 23% tax at the moment. As we scale, we might get a bit more efficient with that taxation, so our tax will come down. So it calculates what our net income is. And then we've also got to look at how the balance sheet is going to flex. What's the net working capital in the business? As that working capital changes going forward, that's going to impact the cash flows. And then all businesses need capital expenditure. So let's assume 2% of annual revenue is capex going through that business and then what the model does is it works out all the cash flows for you it says well okay let's calculate free cash flow so we know the ebitda less interest depreciation amortization less tax and less the changes in the net working capital as we grow the business we calculate operating cash flow then we know what the investing cash flow is that's the capex and then at the moment in time there's no financing cash flow there's no financing going through this deal. But obviously, if you were going to do a leverage buyout, there was going to be some financing going through it. So it would calculate all that. So what the model does is it calculates, it tells us what all of our free cash flow is. And then we need to apply a discount rate because we're not 100% guaranteed we're going to get that cash flow. So we need to apply a discount rate to discount those cash flows to present day value and they compound. So the discount rate four years from now is four times that compounding discount rate. So what the model does is it calculates all those discounted cash flows. It then applies the multiple of, of the, the cash flows. Uh -huh. and the just, Can you mute, please, John, everybody? Sorry. I'm not a host, Carl, so I can't. Okay. All right. Guys, can you mute? Uh, that will be awesome. So you, we go through, we calculate the, that terminal value. That gets discounted. And then we add all that up. So if we were building a discounted cash flow model of the deal I've just shown you, we're coming up with a much higher valuation. It's about $1.8 million, but it's reflecting a lot of that growth than what we put into it. So again, you don't need to remember this, but this is how you would do a discounted cash flow valuation for a business like this. I wanted to show it you because we talk about it all the time. Uh, we've never taught you how to do it because you actually don't need to know it. Um, and I'll explain why you don't need to know it um, a little bit later. So that's a discounted cash flow model. What we've then got is something very, very similar, which is called the capitalized earnings method model. Again, you don't really need to know what that is. It's identical to a DCF model, but it's where you've got very predictable cash flows, no real growth outside of inflation, and you have a much lower risk factor, which tends to be more the kind of the weighted cost of capital that your business has in order to financially engineer itself. So built a capital earnings model in here as well. So very, very similar, but you'll see the growth 
It's just limited to inflation. Inflation is about 6.4% right now. Let's assume over six years, the growth goes back down to kind of 1%. Everything else is identical. But then what we're doing is we're putting in a lower discount rate. So the discount rate's a lot lower. That would reflect, you know, the kind of cost of capital that this business might have in debt or equity and all those different things. So that gives us a much lower valuation, which is very, very similar to the valuation we used before when we used the pure multiple of EBITDA. So normally a capital earnings model will give you a similar valuation than just applying the kind of market rate multiple for the profit and working out the equity value in that way. So you're all probably freaking out about this stuff like, oh my God, like this is like Wall Street bananas. But hey, I just wanted to show you how it worked for those of you that were interested in this. But rest assured, um, you never need to calculate this um, when you're doing your own deals. So let's go back to the slides. The final valuation that I want to share with you, which is really easy to do and it's very, very important, is liquidation value. Now, what's interesting with liquidation value, it's the most common exit strategy for baby boomers. So over 60% of baby boomers, when they sell their businesses, just close the door and turn off the lights, right? It kills their legacy. They have to layer off their employees. They have to let down their customers. And liquidation value is based on a percentage of that balance sheet net asset value. So our jobs as deal makers is to go out and find these baby boomers and buy their companies using creative financing before they ever get to a liquidation value scenario. Because it's better for us to buy the business and keep it going rather than the seller shut the business down um, and walk away. So when we're doing liquidation value, we're looking at that net asset value of the balance sheet, the owner's equity, but we're going to apply an 80% factor on that. Because why 80%? Well, in an ideal world, the owner's not going to get 100% of their asset value, right? They're not. Not all their receivables are going to pay out. All their inventory is not going to be um, at full value. They, they might have a higher fixed asset value than what's on their balance sheet, depending on how aggressive they've done depreciation. But out of the hundreds and hundreds of deals I've done, generally, you could take about 80% of the balance sheet value as its liquidation value. It's the same with liabilities. If you sell your assets at a discount, and you you know you you probably can't do this with the IRS, but if you call all your uh, your suppliers that have accounts payable due, and you call them up, if you pay them straight away, they're probably going to give you a discount, and there'll there'll be an early termination discount for paying off bank loans and leases and all those different things. So so generally, we're looking at about eighty percent of the value of the balance sheet. Uh, for liquidation value. So in our example, we know the balance sheet was about half a million dollars. We're going to turn 80% of the assets into cash. We're going to repay 80% of liabilities via negotiation. So the business is now uh, completely debt-free. All there is in that business is about $400,000, which is the net cash left. So that's the liquidation value. And that's going to become really important when we get into transfer value in a minute. So let's summarize those five valuation methods. We were around a million dollars when we looked at EBITDA multiples. We were $689,000 when we did the balance sheet method, which is the balance sheet value plus the goodwill. The discounted cash flow analysis gave us just under 1.8. The capitalized earnings method gave us just under 1.2. And the liquidation value of the balance sheet was $400,000. If we plot those on a chart and we use the data provided by the Exit Planning Institute, uh, only 1% of, of deals in our kind of sweet spot, the kind of one to five million range, only 1% of those deals ever get done in a DCF analysis. Only 2% ever get done in a capitalized earnings method analysis. 8% of deals get valued through the balance sheet method. 27% of deals get valued through EBITDA multiples. And 62% of deals, sellers just close the doors and turn off the lights. So all they're getting is their liquidation value. So your job, deal makers, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is go and find those deals. Go and find those sellers that if they don't sell the business to me or you or anybody else, they're just going to close it down. That's the game that I want you to play. Awesome, guys. Now that you have all of your financial statements in place and can properly value a business, 
Now you're going to want to learn how to structure the deal, which may change depending on how much you're putting down at the closing table. So you definitely, definitely don't want to miss this next episode in our valuation class. Click here to watch that now, right now.